two two talks in the next hour with plenty of time for questions as well, hopefully. Um, and then we'll have a break for coffee. First up, thank you. So, uh, yes, self introduction. So, my name is Esther Bron. I work in the Netherlands, Rotterdam, Erasmus MC University Medical Center, and where I am an assistant professor of neuroimage analysis and machine learning. Uh, also spent a couple of months of years back here at JCL and uh, yeah so now in now in Rotterdam and um, mostly working on developing methods with my team for disease progression modeling machine learning in dementia and we've also been active in validation so this talk will be mostly about how to do validation and how have we done validation of these models in the past years and how we can improve this and then specifically one type of uh, validation, maybe the form of competitions. Um, so many methods, many models have been, uh, are being developed and uh, Betsy illustrated the why of these models, uh, but these models are you know, not good enough maybe for clinical practice. They're not yet used in clinical practice. And also I think the use in clinical trials is still limited. And I think one key part in making this transition is is better validation of those models. Um, so I'm also talking mostly about dementia. Uh, worldwide, 50 million people are living with dementia. Within dementia, someone else. Someone else. Are you can use everything. Um. What says my microphone is not working. Meaning that can be identified in a healthy or a very early disease population who will be developing dementia, which is uh, yeah, not really a question we, we answer at the moment because maybe we don't have the treatment. The second one is uh, determining clinical status, so which is mostly clinically used. Uh, so, for example, making the diagnosis in an early stage of the disease. Uh, the third one is prediction. So I think that's where mostly this disease progression modeling also comes in. So in people in an early phase in a mild cognitive impairment, can we predict with modeling how their clinical status will be in a couple of years from now? And the last phase is monitoring. So once someone has a diagnosis, can we use modeling? Can we use biomarkers to actually measure the, the track of the uh, to keep the uh, status of the status of their disease and use this, for example, as an outcome measure in clinical trials. So, what model modeling are we talking about? So, I'm here covering any types of modeling: machine learning, disease progression modeling, working on imaging, which is main focus of my research, but also in combination with any uh, multimodal biomarkers, uh, information, clinical information on disease, cognitive testing, and fluid-based biomarkers to predict any of the outcomes in, uh, in those four preclinical questions. So for example, making a diagnosis, Alzheimer's disease, versus controls. And this is a very, as all of you know, I guess, a very large research field, many, many publications being published. And then the question arises, um, yeah, there are many models and which, for which specific question, which models is the best? What strategy should we be using and how can we improve? Um, and then I come to the concept of grand challenges. So grand challenges are, um, 
uh, try to answer the question, how good are the current models and can we distill the best strategy of solving a specific problem um, uh, with, with, with models? And the goal is really to do objective and standardized comparison. So to really think carefully about a validation framework for models, um, make sure that this is objective so that one team doesn't have an advantage over the other teams, but then uh, the ground truth or the, the reference standards is like hidden, hidden for all participants so that we can do uh, objective comparison in a standardized way using predefined um, metrics um, so that everybody has the same standards. So this is a form of benchmarking and organized in, in a competition form because that works for motivating people uh, to do well and to, to participate in this. So the participants here are research teams developing methods. And for me, this, this started uh, in 2013. So in the biomedical image analysis community, a lot of challenges are being organized and were already organized then. And I was at a point in my uh, PhD where I wanted, was looking for collaborations and wanted to organize something. And uh, I was working on uh, computer-aided diagnosis based on imaging. And the thing we realized is that current uh, uh, current algorithms back then also were not just used in clinical practice and validation. Um, all papers in the literature use like slightly different sets for validation. Results were hard to compare. Uh, different performance metrics were used, and also nobody actually used um, assessed the uh, generalizability to other data. So methods should be uh, evaluated to be used in general practice on previously unseen data, and that should also be multi-center data. We want a model to be able to be used in multiple centers. And uh, then we chose to do this for the problem of multi-class classification as was as a diagnosed problem defined in clinical practice, a three-class classification problem, Alzheimer's disease, mild cognitive impairment versus health controls. Uh, so this was the cap dementia challenge based on just solely uh, MRI imaging data at the baseline. And uh, we collected a multi-center data set of, uh, of 560 uh, participants among those three uh, classes. And we invited research groups to train their methods on any publicly available data. And um, so most people use OVNI or data from the ABLE to, to train their models. And this was still the free uh, disease progression modeling and three deep learning models. So we mostly had many participants to mix for vector machines, uh, random forest, uh, Bayesian linear classifiers. So mostly machine learning on pre-computed features. And um, the results were, so we had uh, 15 research teams globally participating with a total of 29 methods. This was a three class classification. So like random guessing would be uh, 33% and all teams except for one performed better than the trend of guessing with the best team having a performance and uh, accuracy. So correct classification rate of 63%. And so th this is not good enough for clinical application, but still we got some valuable insights from this. And where, where I think that the type of classifier that was used didn't matter so much for the results, but it's mostly the attention for pre-processing and using different types, different characteristics from the MRI scan. So intensity, shape, volumes, atrophy. So combining combining different characteristics, that's what led to high performances in general. Um, then uh, a couple of years later within the Eurofonds project, to get people here, we organized a, an, another challenge, a prediction this time focused on prediction with also a bigger variety of methods participating. So also many disease progression models, more regression models, and um, um, yeah, deep learning, of course, using different types of measurements. So not limited to MRI only, but here limited to one data. So everything was done within OVNI. 
and to make sure that the challenge was done in an objective way. And we uh, we, we had the deadline of the challenge set at the end of 2017, uh, and then required the participants to submit all their predictions. And then our validation data set was collected in, in the OPI study after that day. So we made sure in that way that nobody had access to that, uh, to that validation data because it was not acquired yet. And then after one year, uh, Jacob Auscombe was evaluated in uh, 219 participants, and there were three problems that the methods were solving. Uh, prediction of clinical status after one year, prediction of a cognitive score, allosphobia, and prediction of an MRI measurement the size of the chemicals. And so this is a one slide of the results. So more details can, of course, be found in the paper. Um, so for the three prediction tasks, um, we had for diagnosis. Um, so we compared methods to some uh, to some simple methods or some benchmark methods uh, without too much optimization, and we wanted participants to do better than the simple ones, and that worked out well for diagnosis. So participants were able to correct that, predict that quite well with a high area under the curve. Uh, quite well, and also for the MRI measurements and for cognition for Ada's book score that didn't work so well. But I think the explanation for that was already in Betty's uh, talk that maybe in one year, like which we used here, so Betty used 18 months, there's just not so much decline, or the decline is smaller probably than the noise on these uh, tests. So, to Two uh, grand challenges, two competitions that I was involved in myself. And that got us wondering, like one and a half year ago, uh, yeah, are these the only ones, or is this like a common strategy to do evaluation? And I see already some fellow organizers of other challenges here in the audience. So that started us um, thinking what has been done, what has been the impact, how can we improve these challenges? Is this a good way to do validation? And then I started, we started. Um, a review paper, and for that we went to the literature, uh, seeing two frameworks that have been developed to standard ways to do uh, yeah, that, that summarized aspects that are important in doing these evaluation studies. And that's first here um, a survey study done by uh, Lena Meyer Hein and colleagues. So in the MIPI medical image computing community. A lot of biomedical image analysis competitions have been organized and they analyzed these challenges and did some surveys to see what do we find important, what are important factors to take into account. So you can see in the little graph that there's uh, there's an increase of these number of competitions. And um, as you can see from the title, the paper also shows that the, that there's that there's decisions within the competition that influences the results. So there's multiple ways how to rank methods, of course. So do you choose one metric or do you, um, do you combine multiple metrics? And uh, these all result in different outcomes. And I think the, for me, one of the interesting parts also of this paper is the list of factors um, that influence uh, the, the challenge design. So I'm not sure if you can read, but uh, they evaluate, they compose the list of 52 elements and then check for all the challenges that were organized so far, whether these were reported on the challenge website. Um, and that you can see that some of these elements, like the title of the challenge, were reported for all. But of course, but for example, uh, how to deal with, with uh, uncertainty or how to deal with missing, missing, uh, missing data or missing uh, predictions. That was only reported by a few. Well, yeah, these can still influence the results. And another framework that uh, has been uh, reported by Adrian and of Stephen Oyard, they have a they they mention the same elements of uh, challenges, but reported in a different way. And they say more like not every challenge have to report everything, but it's important to realize what the aim of your challenge is. So do you want an inside challenge? Uh, do, 
do you want to cover a small part of the problem space and answer a specific question? Not necessarily something to be applied directly, but to answer a question that could lead to follow up questions that could bring us further. So that's an inside question versus a deployment challenge that really solves a specific problem and results in methods that can be applied. Um, and what we took from these two uh, frameworks is like a list of topics um, that we want to discuss for uh, for the for the challenges in uh, in the dementia field, and that resulted in a review of uh, seven challenges in these four uh, yeah these four topics along the uh, dementia timeline and how how we looked for this so which studies did we include uh, so the medical application area was supposed to be preclinical dementia uh, the study should have been organized as a competition that should be the main focus was on neuroimaging data so neuroimaging data to be included as an input and the challenge stuff was related to screening clinical status prediction or monitoring and um yeah, so that resulted, as I said, in seven challenges. Um, there's a bit more stars here because some challenges had subtasks. So here, the dream challenge that was organized in uh, 2014, they had three subtasks. One of their subtasks was a screening one, so screening for amyloid pathology from genetic and clinical data. And there, then there were two challenges that uh, estimated age from MRI. So that was the machine learning challenge, uh, so organized in 2014, um, and the predictive analysis competition organized in 2019. So that those were aimed at estimating the brain age gap. Uh, so estimating brain age from brain MRI images, and then seeing whether this gap between uh, brain age and biological age um, could be estimated well, and for the PAC competition, there was also an additional test of can we do this without a bias towards uh, towards uh, biological age. Then in the diagnosis challenge, the dream challenge also had a subtask. Uh, so yeah, it's more clinical status actually. Uh, so estimating minimum static sum from MRI uh, that dementia I discussed. And then there was the MCI neuroimaging challenge, which did, which did a four class classification of Alzheimer's disease, MCI converters, MCI stable, and um, cognitively normals from, uh, from MRI scans. So that's basically a prediction and a diagnosis task into one. Um, and then for prediction, there was also the, uh, another task of the dream challenge, but then prediction of. Uh, so prediction of MMSE from genetics and clinical data was the TEPL challenge. And the last one we included was the Myriad challenge, which was more mostly focused on um, yeah, in, independent from the diagnostic state. Can how actively can uh, methods measure, quantify the rates of atrophy for the whole brain and for specific regions? Um, over time, so not knowing the time points, but how accurately can we measure brain volume as we um, So basically, um, there was a lot of differences between those competitions regarding um, the tasks. So none of them were identical, basically. There were differences in data use, metric use, and also how, how which methods were used for ranking. But there were also similarities. So for avoiding cheating, uh, basically all challenges just hit the ground through labels, ground through labels. Uh, yeah, and um, so that's for basically all. And I think this Deadpool and Meliot did some smart tricks here. Um, so for Deadpool, that was uh, having uh, this time cut. So. Uh, Validation data was just uh, in OVNI was uh, acquired after a certain time slot. And for Muriel, there were no, yeah, they, they also blinded time points and swapped them. Uh, and for uncertainty estimation, uh, most methods, basically all challenge use bootstrapping and statistical testing. Uh, basically, all the same tests were used. 
domain findings. Um, so it's hard, well, hard to draw real conclusions here because there were, were so many differences, but I think one conclusion that we could draw is that um, pre-processing with care and methods using a wide range of input features, we saw that trend based being all challenges. So pre-processing and data selection seems really important. Uh, more training, tweet training was also something we saw back in the results for many challenges. And also because of, so these challenges cover 10 years of research in this field. So no single methodology stood out. And also most challenges look at qualitative trends. So which factors lead to a higher performance? So factors such as data types, features, which type of models. But unfortunately, most of the challenges were not able to really do a statistical analysis on this. So a number of submissions were usually insufficient. Um, yeah, so it's but mostly qualitative trends that come out and no hard results. Um, all challenges are inside challenges, so a specific sub problem, not really a direct thought. Um, results are not, yeah, they're all research problems, not really directly applicable to clinical practice, but pushing the state of the art towards clinical questions. Um, Generalizability, so which I discussed before, I think it's really key to clinical impact. And I think the challenges making a data set available um, to do validation on which would give a great opportunity to validate this more. But I think this is um, not fully used yet. So this is limited also by dominance of the ARPNI data in many of these challenges. And um, the code of the algorithms. So the idea would be uh, yeah, we all apply algorithms on the same data set. It would be great if we can apply this further or further analysis, but mostly this is not available. Um, so for future challenges, um, yeah, based on reviewing this, um, I would think there would be a great opportunity to address clinical questions on a larger variety of data. So beyond OVNI and maybe also beyond Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease, OVNI, there is a lot of data available, but especially in areas where less, fewer data is available, um, these, these types of uh, validation studies where data can be released, but that doesn't have to make, be made fully public would be a great opportunity. Um, another aspect that we don't see back is uh, so there's generally there's some involvement of clinicians, but that could be improved. And also, not, we're mostly uh, evaluating accuracy of methods, but not so much how methods could be used in clinical practice. So evaluating this possibility and understandability could be an element in new challenges. Um, assess performance related factors in more detail. And yeah, data, making data available is still a problem, but here maybe federated learning, so sharing the algorithms, offering a one platform to run the challenge could be a solution. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Here's a link to the review paper, and then open the floor for questions. And questions are over, I also have some. Yes. <laughs> Questions. Are you thinking of running a federated learning challenge? Um, no. <laughs> I'm running a federated learning study and uh, running into a lot of challenges within that study. <laughs> but, but, I, but, but, but for the future, I think it, it would be really great to, to, to do so, but not in the next year. I think uh, the, the field of federated learning needs to develop more. And we need to know, yeah. So we see a lot of, of course, with ethics, with local hardware, because uh, yeah, yeah, you need all the data providing centers. Um, yeah, so now we're talking about data being at multiple places, of course, in this trial. And yeah, we need a, you need a technical team and a clinical team everywhere. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think there's enough challenges there to be solved. But I see this more on the long term. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. um, so 
even the high impact of, of uh, processing, feature implementation, etc., for the models, have you thought of um, allowing participants to submit this so that other models can be trained on the same actual data? Because otherwise, you're comparing models that were fed that were trained with totally different uh, features. Yeah, so some of the challenges also take that. So for, uh, I think this differs per challenge. So um, for the machine learning competition and uh, now for some of these challenges, free process data is provided. And uh, it's just a mach this machine learning competition, for example, they just compare machine learning methods. And, um, I think it's an interesting point. If yeah. the model works, does it really matter which data it was trained on? If it works better than anything else, under evaluated, you know, a well set evaluation, it doesn't really matter. Karina, uh, Yeah, no, I, I wanted to say a few words about the successful uh, competition in the way, in, in the way, uh, 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 I, I think it was absolutely great. I think, <laughs> you know, when my students, you, you know, to get together and work on something, but, uh, and then in helping uh, uh, building the community, for one thing, we have all the same data to work, work on. And the next thing is that it actually helps when you, uh, like, theoretically, because when you develop like a new version of the algorithm or something new, you can, you have, you have always kind of done the work to like run it on the platform so you can rerun it and see how you can clear and so on. And I think it would be uh, uh, just a fantastic thing for all the community to continue with it. Seeing how, uh, you know, in computer vision, uh, I think the Pascal challenge, the sequence of the Pascal challenge, and also I've made, you know, the success of machine learning on computer vision. And I think it could be possible in our domain also. I think it would be great that it iterates, but that the team puts a big effort, you know, to solve it. Essentially, it could continue, like the next year of at is going to be the next test set. So you can, you know, you can iterate your new algorithm and see and, and, and continue to work on. I think it would be a great thing for good like that to involve certain clinicians to make sure that the you know the target question are better and and so on. And uh, so I, but, I, I but think I think you I, mentioned here two great aspects of challenges that I that maybe a bit got a bit lost in my talk. So one is community building. So it's yeah. a great way for international collaboration, finding new collaborators and interacting with people, learning about their methods actually, and uh, having something that runs over a longer time. So also, so this, this uh, yeah, the first round of the challenge um, is the real competition. But after that, I think most of the competitions stay open and I still offer a benchmarking platform. Yes, yeah, so I think I, we see the, the still the submissions for that will are coming in. I think it decreases over the years, and maybe also with the effort that the organizers put in, and maybe we get yeah, yeah, we, we volunteers for the next <laughs> competition. A lot of work, it was good fun. I mean, speaking from our point of view, when we organized it, we just cross it downstairs a bit. Um, where we used to, we used to sit, we it, it sparked internal competition as well. Which is a heck of a lot of fun. Well, is your model going to be fine? I don't know how to find out, <laughs> and I also failed. And what? Poetry competition. Poetry competition. <laughs> we have, we have some, some haiku uh, that, we, that we stuck into the webinars. They're still also available. You get to touch if you're interested in learning more about that. We still have the opportunity there to uh, check for a second year follow-up. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and now might be a good time to think about another phase because Adney is looking at renewing and so we might have another deadline where we can cut it off for submission. Yeah, yeah, five years from November 2017, that's not far away. <laughs> I guess the end of the year will be busy again. <laughs> right, um, well, we're um, we're we're just in time, James. So, who knows, Bill Kester? Um, we can look at who funds the challenge because are these all just community groups who need to get one together to agree, or is anyone persuaded that uh, one of these problems? I think for these, they, they are all organized by groups themselves and have like really small funding, but not. Yeah. Because one of the main points about getting better data, what is that process of getting good data? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. 
maybe tag or could get tagged onto some studies that are generated there as a work package. Yeah. Well, yeah, that one wouldn't be also as a traditional. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and it's it's also a lot of work. To, yeah, yeah. I I like it, like it very much, but it's also a lot of work. So, so the the point being made is uh, that funding for these challenges can be uh, difficult. Yeah. yeah. Let's let's carry that conversation. We'll talk after the next talk. <laughs> Thank you, Sri.